and these are in listen only mode. Okay, um, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for the next webinar in the CREMS webinar series. So we're very excited to have with us uh, Professor Marie Thiessen today, who I'll introduce in a moment to be presenting um, the webinar today. And she'll be talking about um, issues and solutions relating to mental health and substance use. Um, but just before I introduce her, just to let you know about some of our other webinars coming up over the year. So we've got a fantastic series lined up for you this year. Uh, so in March, we've got Dr. Nikki Newton and Erin Kelly, and they'll be presenting on personality targeted interventions uh, for prevention and specifically focusing on the prevention program. In April, we've got um, Jack Wilson, Chris Morell and Kath Mills will be presenting on the National Comorbidity Guidelines Training Package. And then in August, we've got uh, Professor Francis K. Lampkin who will be talking about effective models of care for comorbid mental illness and substance use. So if you're interested in registering now for any of those uh, webinars, you can sign up. Sign up's available at comorbidity.edu.au, so you can sign up now. And the best way to stay up to date with all of the webinars that we have coming up over the year is to join our mailing list. So if you do go to our website, you can register to receive all of those updates. Okay, so and as I said, I'll introduce Marie in just a moment, but before I do, for those of you that are joining us uh, for the first time, I'll just introduce um, Sorry, I'll just give you a quick overview um, about CREMS and, ooh, sorry, I think we're just having some technical difficulties. Marie, can you still hear me? I can. Can you see the screen? Okay, there we go. I can. We're up again. Okay, so um, I'll just give a quick overview for those of you joining us for the first time about who we are and what we do at CREMS. So CREMS stands for the NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use. And what we're all about at CREMS is conducting research to improve our understanding of mental health and substance use disorders, and in particular, how and why those problems co-occur. And so to do this, um, in addition, we're working to develop improved strategies um, to and identify the most effective ways to prevent and treat these problems. And to achieve these aims, we work closely with schools, services, community groups, and this webinar is um, part of facilitating that, those lines of communication. And so this is just a photo of the team here at, at CREMS. And you can see there in pink is our director, Professor Marie Thiessen. So as I said, we're very excited to have our director presenting um, for you today. Um, and so just to introduce her, she's the director of CREMS, as I mentioned. Um, she's also uh, an NHMRC principal research fellow at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. And most re recently, an Australian Academy of Health and Me Medical Sciences fellow. Um, and she's made a major contribution to Australia's health and medical research effort in the field of mental health and substance use. And in particular, she's known internationally and nationally for her research on the comorbidity between mental health and substance use problems. So I'll pass over to Marie now. Just flicking over to you there, Marie. And she's going to be presenting on mental health and substance use and illuminating the issues and solutions for us. Thank you very much for that excellent introduction, Lexine. Um, and I'm assuming you can see my screen and we're up with the first slide. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to you today about mental health and substance use and the issues and some of the solutions that we've been seeking to this, uh, this problem um, where people have both mental health and substance use disorders. Um, just to firstly acknowledge the um, fantastic team that I've been able to work with um, very closely in the leadership role at the centre um, across uh, seven universities and across uh, three international universities. So thanks very much to the team. Now, if you happen to work in mental health and drug and alcohol, then this is incredibly important. The burden of mental and substance use disorders now accounts for one in every 10 lost years of health globally. 
Now it's going to take a while for the other disorders and the health system and the funding systems to catch up, but basically you are critical. If you are working in mental health and substance use disorders, you are critical for where we will be in terms of disease burden in the next 10 years. It's these disorders that cause incredible morbidity. It's these disorders, it's mental disorders, behavioural disorders, neurological disorders that are at the very top of the leading causes of disease and disease burden. And of course when they occur together, there's even more morbidity. And so this is basically what gets me out of bed every morning, that we need better solutions. So as I said, comorbidity is common, so it's not just that uh, mental health and drug and alcohol are the leading causes of burden of disease, but it's that overlap. So with psychotic disorders, five times more likely, you're five times more likely to have a drug use disorder, and you're twice as likely to have an alcohol use disorder. Um, very high levels of nicotine dependence in those with psychotic disorders. And for comorbid mental health and substance use problems, these occur in 71% of people in mental health services and about 90% of people in substance use treatment settings. So it really is a very common presentation um, to our clinical services. But it's not just about the years lived with disability that are critical in trying to have better approaches to comorbid mental health and uh, drug and alcohol problems. It's also the years of life lost. So over the last 11 years, um, I've had the enormous privilege to be able to interview and follow uh, over 615 people who entered treatment for heroin dependence. And one of the most um, devastating findings that we have from this cohort is looking at um, when the individuals were born and mapping their years of life until death and then mapping the years of life lost. That if they were like most uh, Australians born um, in 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, you'd expect that they'd live through to um, 65 years of age. So in our cohort, the very first person died of an overdose when they were 20 years old. You can see here that if they'd have lived till 65, they would have had 40, that, that meant they had 40, and of course they didn't, they have 45 years of life lost. Second um, youngest person was 22, 23. So over the 11 years, we've been able to map not just the life that has been lived by these individuals, these 615, but also the number of years of life that they um, could have potentially lived but were not able to because they died prematurely. Overall, 72 people have died in the cohort and that's 1,988 years of life lost. That's of course if you just lived to uh, 65. If you uh, lived uh, to what you'd expect to live in the Australian um, population, that's nearly 3,000 years of life lost. So it's critical that we need better solutions. And comorbid mental health and um, alcohol and other drug use disorders are one of health's most significant challenges. But we just don't know enough in 2016 to meet this challenge. I'm going to spend the next little while talking about what we do know and also some potentially exciting areas where we need to know more, but the bottom line is we still do not know enough how to, about how to meet this challenge. One of the critical things is unmet need for treatment, which is unacceptable in individuals with, uh, with these complex problems. So fewer than 30% of individuals with comorbid depression and substance use disorders will seek help. And that's considerably less than those with depression only, which is 50%, and those with uh, seeking treatment for depression, this occurs eight years earlier than it does for alcohol use disorder, despite both emerging at the same time. So it's sort of odd in medicine to have two disorders, two problems, and actually seek, you know, fewer people seek help. Um, but it really, it goes to the stigma and to the siloed and fractured approach in service provision that we have. So that's the, 
that's the downsides of working in this field and trying to understand what to do better. The upside is that we actually have some great new opportunities. So we have new opportunities for treatments, new treatments, novel and effective treatments for comorbidity. And we have, I think, we're really riding the wave of being able to use technology to actually increase the access of young adults in particular perhaps deal with some of those fragmentation issues that I was talking about, delay, dealing with the delay to seek help, hopefully dealing with some workforce development and taking some of the treatments and new treatments, not just to individuals and to individual services, but hopefully implementing them to scale. So what have we been doing over the last five years in terms of um, of uh, making inroads in these areas. Well, in terms of new treatments for comorbidity, Australia has truly been leading the world in this space. One particularly area, area that's very exciting is around the history of trauma exposure and uh, treatment of trauma and trauma exposure in individuals with substance use. So in those working in alcohol and drug treatment settings, trauma exposure is almost universal among clients. And it's true to say that the vast majority will have experienced multiple, multiple traumas. We, um, and this work has been led by uh, Associate Professor Catherine Mills in collaboration with researchers at Newcastle University, Medical University of South Carolina and uh, Westmead um, Clinic. So the concurrent treatment for prolonged exposure intervention took individuals who had both substance use and post-traumatic stress disorder, um, delivered 12 individual sessions with a clinical psychologist, and the program itself um, contained both CBT with imaginal and in vivo exposure. So the program or the intervention over the 12 individual sessions, um, it addressed psychoeducation, imaginal exposure, um, which is exposure to the traumatic memories, in vivo exposure to feared but safe physical trauma related reminders and stimuli and processing of um, trauma memories. Now why this is innovative is because previously people had felt that prolonged exposure would be contraindicated in individual substance use disorder. So it's traditionally considered inappropriate for use among patients with substance use disorders based on the assumption that the emotions would be experienced, they'd be overwhelming and could lead to more substance use or relapse. Uh, the other concern was that the substance use may actually impair, impair fear activation. So the processing of new information and thereby reducing the treatment effectiveness. And lastly, um, people were concerned, individuals, clinicians around the globe were concerned that cognitive impairment associated with substance use may impair uh, an individual's ability to, to undertake imaginal exposure. So they're all very legitimate um, concerns um, that have been raised previously and it had meant that there actually hadn't been a trial run of prolonged exposure in individuals with substance use disorder to treat, the, to treat the, their post-traumatic stress disorder. So Australia, leading the way, uh, ran a trial with 103 individuals. You can see there the main drugs of concern were multiple but were dominated by heroin and cannabis and amphetamines. Uh, 53, uh, sorry, 55 people were uh, randomly allocated to receive the intervention as I described it and the um, other group just received assessment only and treatment as usual for uh, their substance use. The traumas, um, as I said previously, people entering treatment for substance use, um, a lot of exposure to traumas. Um, you'll, most traumas had been experienced and the medium number of trauma types um, experienced were um, six. So you can see that this was a very, a very challenging group um, to enter treatment. But the potential for clinical gain and if we could actually see if this treatment worked, we're 
previously for many of these individuals they said no one had actually ever asked them about their trauma and how that might be addressed in the past. So what do we find? Uh, we did a nine month follow up period for both groups and for both groups their substance use improved and remember both of them were getting treatment, both groups were getting treatment for their substance use. The severity of dependence improved, um, the PTSD um, symptoms improved, the depression improved and the anxiety. So they did not get worse. And that was a real concern when we started the project, that if you took individuals, those concerns around substance use and post-traumatic stress disorder, both of the symptoms getting worse if you tried to address the um, comorbid problems. And what was really, really rewarding is that the participants randomised to cope, they demonstrated significantly greater improvements in relation to their PTSD symptoms. So if anyone's interested, these, uh, this treatment has now been uh, developed into a manual in the Oxford University series Treatments That Work and that uh, manual have, has both a therapist guide and a patient workbook. And the paper and the data that I presented has been published in the uh, American Medical Association Journal. Uh, JAMA and that is one of the leading medical journals in the world, so go Australia. So one trial demonstrating that we can show some um, significant improvements in um, uh, comorbid in individuals with both post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use really um, uh, gave us the encouragement to uh, examine the treatment of co-occurring problems um, with other groups and particularly the group, the 600 heroin users I showed you the graph of earlier, one of the main indicators of whether that group did well or not was depression, whether they also met criteria for major depression and yet we found time and time again that depression wasn't uh, addressed in uh, treatment for those individuals. So we joined the forces, this work is led by Joanne Ross with uh, Professor Carl Way um, and uh, Associate Professor Glenna Storr here in Sydney and Carl is in the US and we have been developing some interventions for individuals who have both depression and, substance, and are seeking treatment for substance use disorders. It's called behavioural activation treatment for depression um, but within the framework of providing it for individuals, uh, as I said, with substance use disorders. And the main components are increasing awareness of patterns of depression, uh, the life areas that are most important to them, the values they have in these life areas and identifying some activities within these areas that make their life feel more fulfilling. So again, behavioural activation treatment has a long history of success and a long history of good outcomes but hadn't been applied within the context of individuals um, with uh, significant substance use. Uh, the uh, intervention areas that we focused on, the five life areas were relationships, career, helping others, mind, body, spirituality or daily responsibilities. In terms of the values, it was an ideal quality or strong belief in a certain way of living. And in terms of the activities, it was activity scheduling, behavioural monitoring and activity rating. So the intervention depression had to be fairly simple and concrete because this was a group who was also trying to enter treatment and have treatment for their substance use. Um, there are, uh, as I said, quite a significant amount of evidence for the effectiveness of this behavioural activation treatment uh, revised for individuals um, who were entering treatment for substance use. Um, but the, so it's a watch this space as we've just finished that trial. So I've gone through just a couple of the new treatments that we've been uh, designing to and implementing to try and address comorbidity. Um, but I also want to talk about what are some of the current opportunities because it's all very well to have these 
new treatments and to have the manuals associated with these new treatments there, but that doesn't necessarily increase the access of individuals to them. And it does feel like that we're always playing catch up, that even though the disorders begin in adolescence, it felt like our research was focusing really strongly on the cohorts that were 30, 40, 50, 55, not that they're not important, but that we were also not um, paying attention to when disorders were first beginning. And they're going to begin in adolescence or early adulthood. So if you ask uh, a group of people in the general population, when was the first time you had symptoms like substance that are related to substance use disorders and alcohol or drug dependence? When was the first time you had anxiety disorder type symptoms or mood disorder type symptoms? They all cluster around that 15 to 24 year old age group. So some of our more recent research has been trying to understand whether we could actually deliver interventions earlier to this cohort. The other important reason to focus on the 15 to 24 year olds goes back to the burden of disease and the burden of disease data and indicators that I was talking about earlier. And these curves really clearly show you, particularly for depression and for anxiety and for schizophrenia and for alcohol and for drugs, that the global burden, the burden of disease is really strongly targeted and, and occurring in the 15 to 25 year old age groups for drugs, for alcohol and for depression. So if we want to bend that curve and reduce the burden of disease, that's, that's where we're going to potentially have our biggest impact. And the second piece of information, which again comes from our team, to really try and get us to start thinking about interventions early in the piece, not later in the piece, is that the delay to seek treatment is, is incredibly long. So it's great for us to have these new treatments and to be developing the new treatments, but it takes individuals a long time if we're waiting for them to come and seek treatment. So this is the work of Dr. Kath Chapman in our team showing that the medium delay among those with alcohol use disorders who eventually get, make treatment contact in Australia is 18 years. Now that sort of makes sense if you're 19 or 20 when you first start to have problems with alcohol, but you're 35, you're, you're 40 when you start to actually seek help. That's a long period of time where you've not actually sought any help and where potentially you could have bent the curve and, and changed the life course. Because the age that we see people entering treatment is more at that 35, 40 year age group. So what are the faults in the system that lead to these sorts of problems? Well, one is that access is poor. We might have great treatments, but how do people get access to them? The next one is that the fragmentation of services and care, back to the no wrong door or the people feeling they have maybe an alcohol problem and an anxiety problem or a depression, but where do they, how do they get integrated care for those many different problems? As I said, the delay to care is long and often um, the care is focused too late. There's can be poor quality of care, it can be a lottery which care you get and there's workforce and there's stigma. So one of our priorities is to try and develop new treatments that de are developmentally appropriate and be can be taken to scale. And working off the exciting research that you can actually treat these comorbid disorders in the earlier trials that I mentioned, but can we actually treat them in an earlier cohort? And then when we've treated them in an earlier cohort, can we then work out if there's a way to take that to scale and get them as available as possible. Luckily, we have an innovative country and Australia is clearly the innovative in e-health. I'd just like you to, to reflect on how many of you actually checked your emails um, on your mobile phone before you had breakfast this morning and uh, how many of you uh, checked your emails and your phone before you went to sleep was the last thing you did? Or how many of you 
bumped into a bunch of young people walking along the road uh, looking at their phones as this group are here this morning. So I mentioned earlier our trauma and substance use in adolescence and our really exciting international results in that space and that there are now manuals available for treatment of trauma and substance use in adolescence. But I also want to reflect on the fact that if I'm arguing that we want to be getting in earlier and we're wanting to be making, taking things to scale, that there are no evidence-based treatments for adolescents with co-occurring post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use disorder anywhere in the world. So it's great to have these grand ideas, but we still need the research um, to undertake the first trials in this area and very excitingly and after many, many years of persistence, uh, Associate Professor Kath Mills actually has just had funding from NHMRC to conduct the very first randomised control trial of integrating treatments for co-occurring PTSD and substance use among adolescents. So again, Australia and Australian researchers and Australian clinicians leading the world in uh, the new treatments that we need. Um, in terms of depression, again the theme of looking at depression and problematic alcohol use, we've actually been very fortunate to have some success in treating co-occurring depression and um, problematic alcohol use in young people and this time taking an online intervention. So this is the work of Dr Mark Deedy who is now based at the Black Dog Institute and uh, collaborators there and it was Taking the, I, the principles that depression was very common, depression and substance use and depression and alcohol use commonly occurred, um, but also trying to deliver an online program to, to take to scale some interventions. So the DEAL project is very brief, it's a four week intervention. Um, it provides an intervention for depression and alcohol use problems. Again, a non-confrontational approach regarding alcohol use. Uh, there's motivational enhancement principles, CBT components and a skills based and very interactive. So it follows the story of a selected case study and it has very personalised normative feedback. Uh, the drawings are done so that there's personification of the experiences of young people and they were developed very, very um, in a co-design with young people, in a collaborative fashion with young people. Again, a flexible in timing and content. So that can be a little bit um, nerve-wracking in terms of delivering an intervention where you're trying to be incredibly interactive and allow flexibility in timing and content but hope that the people who are coming into the trial also get the effective ingredients. So what were the four sessions? Um, we just outlined them briefly here. So week one was very much about where are you at, psychoeducation and goal setting and giving normative feedback but also looking at the relationship between mood, activity and alcohol. Week two was focused on getting moving again, so again behavioural components, um, decisional balance and trying to increase activity scheduling. In terms of week three, it was taking charge of your thoughts, um, monitoring your mood and some small amount of cognitive restructuring as a focus and week four, coping with tough situations. You can see that visually um, I find the cartoons in Deal incredibly confronting but they were developed by young people with a really strong emphasis to try and um, pers do personification of the experiences of depression and alcohol and the problems that the individuals were experiencing. So I don't want to do anything or see anyone or feel anything. This is one of the examples um, from the program, written really like a young person with a clipboard uh, uh, note so that it, it had a feel um, uh, of uh, being much more appropriate to 18 to 25 year olds, uh, we hope. So the DEAL project um, 
when we hit the button, all uh, recruitment was done online and when we hit the button we were just not sure how many 18 to 25 year olds would respond to Facebook and to um, Google Ads and assess themselves for eligibility for the program. Over an incredibly short period of time, over 800 pe young people aged uh, 18 to 25 assessed themselves for eligibility to get help for the deal pro for the, from the deal project and that was in response to ads which ran that said are you having some problems with alcohol and are you feeling down or are you feeling down and you're using alcohol to help you cope. In terms of baseline assessment, um, a quite a large number of those uh, people were excluded. We had very strong exclusion criteria. Um, as this was part of a, a study, um, so current suicidal ideation, for example, was an exclusion criteria. Uh, 104 people came through to do the baseline assessment and um, of those, uh, half uh, were allocated to receive the deal um, intervention and half to an active control called Health Watch, which was online information about uh, drugs and um, alcohol. At the end of the trial, people you know, were offered the access to the uh, deal treatment. So what do we find? Well, they were a group um, who were uh, quite elevated um, on the PHQ-9 and on the audit score. Um, their mean drinks per week, oh, previous, go. Previous, pick your pattern. Their mean drinks per week were 15, and the, they were drinking an average of two days a week. And that's sort of important there because while they're only drinking a median, or while they're drinking a median of 15 drinks per week, they're actually drinking them over um, two days a week. So there's an intensity of drinking which is much more common in that you see in 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, in terms of module completion, um, even though it was only four modules, we did get close to you know, 20% completing module four, but you could see it's incredibly hard to keep get people to stick uh, to interventions. So most people completed module one, um, over, nearly half completed module two, but there was a drop off in terms of how many completed the four modules. And what do we find? Well, post-treatment um, follow-up was definitely associated with um, a greater reduction in depression scores. It, we had a two-fold uh, greater reduction in standard drinks consumed per week and about 80% uh, greater reduction in drinking days per week compared to the control. So this was immediately post uh, receiving deal. Um, remember, it's a four-session intervention, so very brief and that at six months follow-up, improvements were maintained, but um, unfortunately the between group differences were lost. So we really need to better understand how to achieve longer outcomes, but I've got to say I'm very excited to even find short-term follow-up uh, results um, and short-term outcomes in such a brief intervention. So, the reality, even if we've got some successful programs, we've worked out some ways to um, hopefully deliver them across in a developmental way with uh, older people and with younger groups, and we've worked out some ways to make hopefully the transition and feasibility and implementation of them by taking some of the components online more uh, possible. The reality is that e-programs, especially in mental health and drug and alcohol, just exist largely independently of traditional service settings. Often they're only available within research projects um, and that really does mean that it's very hard for healthcare providers to utilise them or to get access to them and utilise them in their practice. Even those where they are available under utilisation of these sort of e-health programs is quite high. Um, researchers also faced face resistance to the implementation of e-health in traditional healthcare settings and justifiably so because the researchers are developing their programs for research, not for implementation. 
and we often really place insufficient e emphasis on how you might integrate e-health and traditional services. The other problem is treatment can often depend on the provider's preference um, and uh, not necessarily um, patient choice. So we need a better way of balancing all of these issues. Um, so what are the opportunities? And that's the final, the third piece of the puzzle that I wanted to talk to you about in terms of what are current opportunities for using technology to address not just how we might get treatments to people, but how might we integrate them better so we've got a less fractured um, delivery system. And I'm inspired by what's happening in the technology world more generally. And it's really turned the way that we think about delivery on its head. So Uber is the world's largest taxi company, but it owns no vehicles. And Facebook is the world's most popular media owner, but it doesn't create any content, we do. And Airbnb is the world's largest accommodation provider, but it doesn't own a single hotel. And thanks to Tom Goodwin for these, um, for these fantastic analogies, because it really does mean something is changing. And if it changes in taxis and changes in social media and changes in accommodation, it's gonna change in health too. And I really want Australia to be the lead there. Perhaps we can get um, improvement in access uh, so that with online access, dealing with some of those access issues. Hopefully technology can help us with some of the coordination and fragmentation issues. Hopefully the delayed of care might be reduced with earlier detection and reduction in stigma. The poor quality or the, the inability to actually be sure about what sort of care you're going to get depending on who you see. Workforce training and in terms of stigma, hopefully a little bit of anonymity to respond to that. But it's not going to work if we don't integrate it in with our current systems because the, the personal um, health system and the caring of the individuals and the clinicians um, who are often the first line of call for people is critical. So to that end, um, the last piece of our research puzzle that I wanted to talk to you today uh, about was Eclipse. And that's trying to take some of the effective online programs that we've been developing and work with partnerships, um, of, with clinical services in partnership to try and integrate those so that individuals can have access to free, trusted, clinically proven programs for mental health and substance use. And individuals don't then have to search the internet themselves to find which programs. They can actually have a portal which allows them through their clinical services that they've approached um, or are working in to gain access to where, what we know is evidence-based. So Eclipse is in the very early stages of development. Within Eclipse, there will be access to evidence-based online programs like, for example, the SHADE program, the DEAL program that I spoke to you about uh, earlier, uh, programs around healthy lifestyles, again, which are, have randomised control trials showing their effectiveness, and programs addressing um, some of the more novel and emerging upcoming uh, drug problems such as ICE. The, the concept is so that we can hopefully break down some of the stigma associated with uh, accessing uh, care so that people feel like they, if they can't imagine the words leaving their mouth over the phone, as the first person here in, our, uh, in the comments from uh, an individual in some of our online programs, that uh, they might be the sort of deal when I'm ready to get to the side of it, I let loose, so to speak even if it's not replied to straight away, um, my side or parts are, are out there. As I said, I struggle to talk about it. So are there, are there ways to engage with people so that they can start the, the conversation with us um, online? So Eclipse is going to try and address this gap by working closely with clinical services to offer a portal um, to individuals to give them access to uh, the proven programs. 
Um, we've developed uh, already some um, focus group work to see whether people coming in through services would be interested in such a portal. And the responses have been uh, very, very positive. So I use computers a lot. My sites aren't available 24 hours. It's much easier to be honest through a screen. And I want to use it for the full gamut, um, any illness and drug and alcohol. I'd be more likely to use it if I can remain anonymous. So our expert consultations are giving us some indication that, in, that people uh, would be interested in using these sorts of online programs. Um, our next challenge is how do we develop clinical decision trees which allow people to get access to the programs so that they're not coming through the wrong door, they get, uh, process, the, they get uh, advice and information and online programs that are dealing with all of their problems but that they don't feel like uh, they're shut out. So we now have um, are working with individuals and services to work out what are the types of questions which would allow people to answer them pretty quickly but then get access to the program that was most appropriate for them. So some of them are pretty obvious, like I need help to improve my mood or I need help with my alcohol use. Then if they're answering yes to both of those and they're 18 to 25, then possibly the DEAL program could be something that might be helpful for them. So we're currently working through the processes about how do we do this and then how do we integrate this in with the clinical services. Um, an alternate way, rather than just asking the questions, might be to actually also ask a very uh, simple and structured questionnaires, which could also then lead people to link the questionnaires, like for example, answers to the alcohol use disorders inventory or the uh, depression, anxiety and stress scale. Um, given certain responses to those questionnaires, could that then lead them to ask, well, is DEAL appropriate for you, or maybe one of the other online programs. Clearly, these sorts of programs won't work unless we have excellent links with local health, health districts and clinicians, and we've got a very clear idea about what the pathways are to care for people. So. Um, uh, through the development processes, we're trying to understand in what way could eHealth be linked in with existing clinical pathways so that it's helpful rather than, um, than not. Because while technology has much potential, um, the critical issue will really be trust. And all of this is going to fall apart if we don't do it in partnership and with trust with clinicians and with the clients. Um, I really feel like once information becomes available, it'll really turn existing relationships on their head and, you know, the patient will see you will become a much more common focus rather than waiting 18 years to come and see us. And that's the exciting research that is undergoing a very, very quick snapshot of the research happening at the Centre for Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use. And I just want to acknowledge the fantastic team um, here who are working towards improving our understanding of prevention and treatment of comorbid health disorders. Um, here's a list of the team members who have worked on the many projects that I've had the privilege of presenting to you today. And I just finally will leave up on the screen the famous technology predictions. Um, in particular, that uh, Ken Olson from the Digital uh, Equipment Corporation in 1977 said very clearly that there is no need for any individual to have a computer in their home. I'd just like you to think about that and reflect on how many of you checked your emails before you had breakfast this morning. So the world is changing and I think Australia is really at the forefront. Thank you everyone. 
Thank you so much, Marie. That was fantastic. And I've already got, um, so I forgot to mention at the start that we have a Q&A session um, at the end, but luckily uh, your audience is onto it and they've already um, sent through a few questions for us. Um, so, uh, so please do send through anything that you'd like um, to know from Marie. So the first question, a really interesting question right off the bat. Um, so one of the big issues we experience in dual diagnosis is the argy-bargy between services. Mental health says it's um, DNA responsibility, they say it's mental health, um, and the person doesn't get their needs for clinical support met. Um, and in particular, uh, this is evident in rural settings where there aren't many options for services. So the question is highlighting a really, an issue I guess that we hear a lot there, um, Marie. Um, and the question is how do we advocate for our people um, with services who do um, this handballing back and forth? Yeah, it's a really important question and um, it's, um, it's so multi-layered about why that handballing actually happens. Um, there's a, a real sense about not wanting, you know, people are overworked, busy, how do they deal with all of these issues? I think for me, um, the increasing Australian evidence is, is really strong. And so if you can get your hands on some of these great resources that I mentioned uh, to you and through our website, um, where um, often it's a lack of confidence or people just not knowing about them. So for example, um, getting your hands on some of the resources where there are treatment manuals set up demonstrating that you can actually treat both problems at the same time, as simple as that. Uh, like if this is the case, then um, what are the barriers to us being able to do this within our own, within our services? Mm. Um, but that said, you know, it it is also a challenge, particularly you mentioned rural areas and advocating in rural areas, and that's why I think the you know the internet won't answer it all, but it might give people some help along the way. And for some of those treatment trials that I showed you, some of the online treatments are actually really successful. So you can get access to, um, to many of those programs. Um, we need, I think, programs like Eclipse out there. Uh, at the moment, we've only got it in two local health districts. It would be fantastic to have that available across rural communities. Mm. So perhaps you can do those programs online and advocate for your people by saying, well, we've done these programs online and these programs are available online. Why aren't we making um, online, why, don't, why aren't we making care available? Mm. So yeah. I, I actually, I, I, bottom line is not to see this as a problem that, do, that doesn't have some solutions, that there are some solutions. How do we get them in front of people? Mm. And I guess, um, so it sounds like what you're saying is that there's, there can be a lack of confidence um, in, the, in the services with the people with service delivery when, they, when they're um, having comorbid presentations but, and not being aware of the resources that might be available to them to help um, deliver treatment in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I heard you mention a, a webinar um, on a <laughs> no. training package coming yes. up yep. um, on the comorbidity guidelines. Yep. And so there, there's a really cool way to be able to advocate for people within your services. You know, if that training package is coming up, mm. um, how can we get um, access to it for our clinicians? So... Um, they get the support they need to provide rather than handball. Handballing is, that is such a, that's an incredibly powerful way of describing it because it is exactly what happens. Mm. Um, so um, how can you advocate? I think having the knowledge that there are um, interventions that work um, across uh, if a person does have a complex presentation, yeah. get on our website and get access to those. Um, taking them in and saying, there are these treatments for dealing with both these problems, how do I get access to them? 
Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So yeah. So the comorbidity, um, the comorbidity webinar coming up in April will be a fantastic opportunity for people to learn more about some of the resources available as well. Um, okay. Yeah. So that. And then don't forget online. Yes. I know there's not that many options for services, so. Get in and advocate for more access to online. So that links to another question that's come through about um, so about the Eclipse program. So you mentioned it's only available now in two um, health districts. Do you are you aware of any plans um, for other states to develop similar technology? Yep, we're really hoping um, to do that. And I, you know, offline, if people. Uh, online are interested, they could send us a message or send me an email, let me know they're interested so that, um, you know, as we, we plan towards rollout, we can know um, which groups are interested. But yeah, definitely trialling it in just two uh, area health services at the moment, but very excited to think about the concept of rolling it out. Mm. Okay, and we've got a question um, which which might uh, link again to what you've been talking about. So um, this person said there's no drug and alcohol services in our area in Armadale for younger for people younger than 18 years old. Would you have suggestions um, where this person might look for resources? What could be offered? Oh, that just breaks my heart to hear. In you know, it's a large rural community, and there's no resources for people under um, 18. Ah, oh, it's just, it's just terrible. Look, I, I think there are some um, options uh, for resources online with for under 18 year olds for information around drugs and alcohol and for um, interventions around drugs and alcohol. So. Um, there are not clinical services, as I'm hearing it, but um, uh, which is a serious concern. There are um, there are some information, fantastic information sites, if people want to get some information. Um, so, for example, from uh, schools and school counsellors, um, there's uh, our Positive Choices website, which provides access to information around drugs and alcohol at that sort of younger age group and for school counsellors. Um, in terms of uh, getting access to the programs that I'm talking about, again, many of our online programs, are, you know, that's the problem. I, I can tell you about the research, but we really need to work out the way to make them available to people. Um, it, in terms of getting um, uh, for, I know particularly around um, concerns and increased concerns and issues around methamphetamine uh, and particularly in rural communities, there are increasing numbers of websites that are going to give people access to um, information but not necessarily clinical, mm. uh, clinical services. So I'm really sorry to, to hear that and it just points to the fact that we really, really need many more resources for people. Okay, um, another interesting question here. Um, Marie, are you aware of any effective steps, interesting effective steps <laughs> being taken to address stigma towards substance use among mental health workers? So stigma towards substance, yes, so I guess among mental health workers there can be a stigma um, towards people presenting with substance use disorders, if I understand the question correctly. And yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, our uh, people who work in um, our services are um, yeah, part of the general population and we've, we, you know, they they also uh, have the same um, uh, you know, it's the same pressures upon them um, and we really have a very positive attitude in our community towards drug and alcohol and I think that that 18 year gap for people seeking treatment is a really strong example about how you have to be almost the bravest person in the world to seek treatment for drug and alcohol in this country because it's so tied up with positive images and positivity that it's almost, uh, you know, it's hard for people to even fathom that you could be having problems with drug and alcohol. So there is a huge societal stigma around this and um, that 18 year um, gap 
between first having problems and seeking help is a really clear example. Mm. So the question was, is there anything about dealing with the stigma of addressing drug and alcohol pro people problems in people uh, who are you know, in the mental health field? Across, yeah. And that is uh, in clinicians, yeah. And that, that very first talk, uh, very first paper, um, the trauma and substance use um, uh, paper. The reason no one had tried to do it, a lot of it was because people in the mental health field, PTSD, prolonged exposure, didn't feel like you could do it with people with substance use. Mm. So some steps for me are getting the evidence to show that the research and the interventions work. That's really important. So that's the one. That's the one step for breaking it down. The other step is the confidence issue, and so mm. I think we. We address the stigma if we address it with a bit of evidence that where things work, but we also address, it's not just stigma, it's also confidence in dealing with drug and alcohol problems and, and a sense that people can actually get better. So again, it's the, the steps for us are trying to do some of these training packages so people can have some skills in this um, space. Yeah. But, you know, we also... Uh, we also need, just as we've done with depression, the last 15 to 20 years we've seen huge strides in reducing the stigma um, associated with depression. We've got to do the same thing for people who have problems with alcohol and, or heroin or cannabis. We, we need to reduce that stigma. Um, uh, with clinicians, I think it's also about increasing confidence that you can actually work in this space. Yes, and I have to say that really resonates um, for me, Marie, because coming from a mental health uh, psychology, mental health background, I yeah, I resonate with that um, just lack of confidence, and it can be quite frightening when you're first starting to see patients that have substance use problems when you don't know how to approach it. Um, so uh, yeah, I really do think that that is a big part of it. So a few people have um, sent through questions about the comorbidity guidelines and training um, package that we were talking about. So we will have that webinar in April. But in the meantime, you can go to our website, um, comorbidity.edu.au, and you can ac access the guidelines. So a lot of resources there um, about um, management of comorbid mental health and substance use disorders. So we will be sending out the slides from today's webinar. Webinar, um, and in that email, also the video of the session, so you can watch it again and just catch all the bits of Marie's um, fantastic talk that you might have missed. Um, so in there, I will send some of the links. Um, so there have been a few specific questions asked through about the DEAL program, um, about the comorbidity training package, and about Eclipse, so asking for more information and, and sort of linking in. So what I'll do is put in some extra contact details um, that you can follow up to find out more about those um, programs. So we'll let you off the hook there, Marie. Lots of questions coming through, but um, I'm afraid we're out of time. So thank you so much for today's really insightful um, presentation. I've certainly enjoyed it, and I'm sure um, everyone has. Thank you, everyone, for, um, as always, your really interesting questions. It's been a great discussion. And we hope to see you again um, at one of our next webinars across the year. So as you've seen, we've got um, three um, between now and August coming up, um, so do sign up to our mailing list to, to, to be informed about those dates um, and to register for those events. So thank you very much and have a great day. We hope to see you next time. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, Lexine.